All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by David Branscombe. He's the chief commercial officer at Rebel Mining, a company that offers custom solutions to help enterprise companies mine Bitcoin. He believes that with almost, as with almost any problem in energy, Bitcoin fixes this. With experience in immersion and hydro cooling, advances in chip technology and heat recapture uh, innovations, David knows we are just scratching the surface of what Bitcoin can do to make a better future. So welcome, David. I'm happy to have you uh, on the pod. Thank you, Brian. Happy to be here. Yeah, it was great meeting you in real life. Super fun to uh, meet people you uh, sort of know from the internet. How sure. uh, how did you experience uh the Bitcoin Atlantis conference. Oh, it was it was good. Um, I mean, that kind of felt like going to the Super Bowl if you're a Bitcoiner, um, or you know, maybe <laughs> yeah. not the Super, maybe the World Cup, right? Depending on what country you're in. But um, I mean, people from yeah. all over the world coming, getting to meet like you and some other people from Europe that you know I hadn't met in person. Um, you get to see them in person. It's a unique experience, especially when you realize uh, you're a lot taller in person than I, than I thought on Twitter. So <laughs> it's, you're, you're very you're tall. Funny uh, comments on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Especially compared to other people in Madeira. I don't know what happened, but you were, you're like twice as tall as most the average man. So, um, who was that you took a picture with that did there, uh, on Twitter? Do you, you Eric, a Eric Stacks. Yeah. With Eric Stacks. Or yeah, Luke Royals. Good. Yeah. Luke, Luke, uh, poor yeah. Luke. Luke had shrunk. Um, Luke had shrunk and you had grown. So, yeah. Uh, but it is yeah. really, uh, it is kind of surreal. Um, I met Michael Saylor real briefly in the, uh, just walking around the uh, concourse. And I grabbed him and he was nice mm -hmm. enough to say hello and had a whole conversation with me. And uh, he walked away and I thought to myself, I was like, I didn't get a selfie with Michael Saylor, but I literally just had a 10 minute conversation with him about finances and his strategy. And he was like, he was just so very genuinely interested. It was impressive. Uh, Samson Mo got to meet Samson in person uh, for the first time. Uh, Jack Maulers, right? So you, you meet these people that are building incredible things, uh, doing incredible things with Bitcoin. And they're, uh, I guess I, I've been kind of in the mining space, right? The infrastructure side. So anybody from the financial side of Bitcoin or um, financial or development, that's very fascinating to me, right? Because that's not my background. So I, I try to understand yeah. as many of the tentacles of Bitcoin as I can, at least know which direction that octopus is reaching, right? That sort of thing. And, um, yeah. and just to know, I, I, I don't need to know the details or how everything works, but I need to know what they're trying to accomplish. That way, if something comes my direction that I can help someone else with, you know, trying to push that, uh, put those puzzle pieces together and help people out, whatever they're working on. So it was, um, man, just nonstop, no sleep, fantastic, you know, a Bitcoin experience and meeting new friends, making new friends and uh, getting to meet your heroes. is it's uh, It was a blast. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I had the same experience. Just so fun that everyone is so approachable. Everyone is into the same thing, but you know, there's all these people from different backgrounds, and um, yeah, it's just cool to to learn about their expertise. That's uh, mm -hmm. I, I have the same. Like, there's all these dimensions of Bitcoin that you know you come across, but we'll definitely get to that. That uh, that yeah. is on the list to to talk yeah. about. And but first, uh, I wanted real, to ask you, like, real quick, can I can yeah. I make an announcement just so? And I haven't made like an official announcement in this of kind of setting, but I did put it on LinkedIn, but I forgot to tell you. So I have recently left Rebel Mining as chief commercial officer and Energia, which was my former company. I'm with a new company uh, called uh, Vea Energy, V-E-Y-A. And we are, um, this is a quick, just real quick. This is a move to, uh, I started my Bitcoin journey on the infrastructure side, coming in through immersion cooling. And then I very slowly just moved upstream to the power source. Uh, Vea Energy is going to be uh, operating and, and putting together behind the meter off grid mining opportunities, uh, natural gas and other uh, renewable energies like waste energy, 
uh, things like that, those sorts of projects. So that is, I just wanted to, since you introduced me to the Rebel, just wanted to let you know I've moved to a different position, but I'm focused specifically on energy production and how it can tie in and benefit Bitcoin and vice versa, how Bitcoin mining can benefit the energy infrastructure we have, not just in the U.S., but anywhere, uh, especially reusing that energy multiple times for, through heat recapture and things like that. So just wanted to give you that little, quick little update. That just happened like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Awesome. It's on my list to to talk about because I'm super, super interested in that, but not very knowledgeable yet. So uh, we'll definitely get to that. The first thing I uh, I wanted to ask you is which generation do you belong to and how is your experience educating like your generational peers? Are you trying to dox my age here, Bram? Is that what you're trying to do? I don't know. You don't uh, have to say your age. <laughs> I am. A, it depends on who you ask. Um, I'm on kind of the tail end of what you would consider to be Gen Y, probably uh, Gen X and Gen Y. Um, and uh not but i'm not like a millennial so i was born in i'm 46 years old so i was born in 78 so whatever that number is that mm. kind of puts me on the edge of a couple of different uh generations so i feel like it's an interesting kind of place to be i have a lot of just overall business experience um but i also have you know a family and a mortgage and i'm further down than a lot of bitcoiners are when they're in their 20s and their 30s and so yep. I am in kind of a unique, I think, spot. Uh, I'm not as old as, you know, like, you know, you've got some guys like Michael Saylor and then you've got Bob Burnett that have a ton of experience, right, that I don't have as much experience as they do. But uh, I'm also not, you know, fresh out of, uh, you know, university or still trying to kind of figure things out, you know, uh, from, a you know, which direction. Well, that's not true. I don't know which direction my life is. It changes every six months. So, but I've had that experience. So I, it's kind of a weird spot to be, right? Most people in this space are either older than me or younger than me. Not a lot that's right there at that same mm. age. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, I just quickly, uh, quickly Googled. You're like on the tail end of Gen X and... Yep. Um, and and at the start of the millennials, but like so so your age range, well, you know people who have older kids, yeah, uh, of course a mortgage house, etc. Like mm -hmm. when you talk to people in your age range, like uh, about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. they are already obviously well entrenched in the in the in the old fiat money system. So is yes. that something you run into when you talk about that? So. I, this is kind of weird, but like I looked up the other day and I can't remember the last time I talked to like friends my age, right? Like I make, I made a point to oh, really? go, yeah, <laughs> I made a point to go have dinner with some friends the other night um, and uh, who are my age and they've got boys about my boys. Age. I've got two boys, 17 and 13. And so I'm kind of on the tail end of that, right? My 13 year old only has about five years left until he's out of uh, high school, right? And so whether he wants to go to college or whatever, I don't know, but we're we're working at um it I just I don't know. I'm so into Bitcoin um that it's like I don't really talk to what I'd call normies much anymore. It's almost um it's almost painful to have like those like conversations about, "Oh, hey, how's your job going?" right? You know, cuz my job uh working in Bitcoin specifically feels so like revolutionary and startup and it's it's different than you know what most of my you know contemporaries are doing that at my, my age um it it's hard it's it's actually kind of almost physically painful yeah. to sit through some of these i'm trying to be nice and i'm like i don't really care about 
you know, who you're going to vote for. I don't really care about this. I don't really care about, you know, what's going on here. It's like it's, when you see Bitcoin, psychologically, something changes for you. Um, and it's very interesting. I'm at two opposite ends of the spectrum on the Bitcoin side. It's like I focus on the hardware and energy side, infrastructure, the tangible. But I'm really super intrigued by how Bitcoin tied into energy uh, and the way that the way that it's tied into energy down the on the other end ends up basically um, uh, changing the way you think, the way you act, you know, the psychology of who you are as a person. It changes everything. Yeah. And I thought it was just going to be, OK, this yeah. is going to be a cool job and I'm going to make some money. But now it's like I think everything in my life looks different, like everything. And you can't you can't go back. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that, too, in a minute, because I, I think that's super interesting and I can definitely relate to that. So I'm super interested to hear yeah. how that went for you. But first, I wanted to ask what misconceptions did you have about Bitcoin initially and how did they change? Like, what did you have to do or learn to to change those? So there's kind of two things. My favorite phrase that I've heard a lot of people, some some good friends say is, you know, when, not when were you orange pilled, but when did you first ignore Bitcoin? And for me, it was 2013. Like I could have gotten in at 2013, 2014 timeframe. And I had all these computers and you could still mine on, you know, GPUs. And I had all these 480 GPUs in these computers at this call center I'd set up. There's not a lot, maybe like a dozen of them. But uh, I had a friend, a guy that was working for me say, we should mine Bitcoin. We even have free electricity. We should mine Bitcoin. It's like, what's Bitcoin? So he talked to me for about 30, 45 minutes. Then I got done. He goes, so what do you think? And I said, that is the dumbest, stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, that's magic internet money. It's never going to work. <laughs> it's never going to work, right? And I like left it alone and ignored it for another, uh, I don't know, maybe seven years. And then 2019-ish. I started kind of looking at it, right? Um, and so my biggest misconception was just not taking it at face value and looking, kind of saying, oh, this is interesting technology I need to dig into. That's the biggest misconception is people just assume it's a scam or because they don't understand it, right? But that happens with everything in life. If you don't take the time yeah. to understand something, you, you don't know if it's true or not. So that's a challenge. And that's the biggest misconception is people just think it's a scam. Um, especially on the normie side. And then the, um, what was the other part of that? Um, I lost my train, my train of thought. The other part of that was. So when, when did you, oh. so you thought it was a scam or that was yes. a misconception? Well, not, not what you thought, but you had that misconception. Like how yeah. did you actually get it? Yeah. So, so this is okay. Th thank you. So. The other end of that that connection is a misconception is people, I say I work in Bitcoin and people start asking me technical questions about Bitcoin and I don't know, right? I can't tell you how the time chain works. I'm not a developer. I don't understand how transactions, I like watching the mean pool, but I don't like understand how all the blocks are put together. I don't understand all that technology, right? I'm not that technical a person. When people ask me, how long have you studied Bitcoin? I said, well, I've actually studied Bitcoin less than I've studied the monetary systems, right? So started learning. I read the Bitcoin standard, which honestly, for a, a newbie with not fi no finance background, is kind of challenging, right? I would read a chapter and then I'd spend like 20, 30 minutes on Google researching what I just read, right? To verify it, understand economics, yeah. uh, the history of money, all that, st all that stuff, right? It was almost like a it was almost like a textbook. I'd, I'd like read a chapter and then I'd have to like it, write and answer questions and stuff. Um, it's a study. So, yeah, it is a study. And so there's other books out there now that, you know, um, Brian DeMint's got one that's, I think, good for normies kind of as an intro, as a primer. Right. And then and then you dive into Safetyne and you get uh, you get, a, you know, deeper in. Right. But what I found was between that and podcasts. With like uh, the first, you know, what is money podcast? Michael Saylor, um, what's his name? Andreas and Andreas Antonopoulos, right? I started watching some of those like older podcasts yep. and understanding. I've studied money as a whole and the dollar system and previous fiat currencies and history more than I've studied Bitcoin. 
So it's like, I don't need to know how Bitcoin works. I just need to know how it fixes the problems, right? I probably know more about inflation, the central banking system, uh, Austrian economics, all of these things more than I actually know about Bitcoin, because those things are what taught me what's broken and how Bitcoin actually fixes it, right? So for me, it wasn't really saying, you know, oh, I understand and get Bitcoin. I was like, oh, if I think Bitcoin has even a 1% chance of doing what people say it's going to do, I know that my dollar has a 90% or has a 100% chance it's going to be worth less next year than it is right now. Right. So that that alone, knowing how broken our fiat system was, just made me say, I don't know if it's better or not, but the chances are this is a smarter system because I had no 100 percent that my dollar is going to be debased. Right. So that was kind of the study that got me all in. And I'm I'm happy to say I'm basically I'm, I got to zero. I don't know if that's the right term. Maybe it's I'm 100 percent Bitcoin. Right. But I have very little fiat cash at all at any given moment. Um, I am just learning about the new system, how to you know manage taxable income, KYC versus non-KYC Bitcoin, how to manage it from a long-term retirement uh, or you know liquid savings, liquidity standpoint, all of those things. Learning how to live on a fiat or live on a Bitcoin standard, even when I'm still living in a fiat world. And I think that is a big opportunity for education to teach Bitcoiners and people and normies as well to say, this can be done. And if someone streamlines that process, like there's products out there like Strike that, you know, and, and Fold, the Fold uh, card and things like that, that are getting close, right? Once we get to a point where they're just like, yeah, deposit, you can have your checks or your EFTs or, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, electronic funds transfers or whatever wires directly into this, we will put it in Bitcoin. And then when you need to spend it, we will automatically do it in Bitcoin, take your Bitcoin and convert it and send, right? Like Strike does. So wh whoever kind of fixes that and makes it smooth, yeah. we'll see adoption move pretty quickly. Awesome. Uh, I, I think we experienced a little bit lag, so I'm going to wait until you're fully finished and then I'll ask my question. Okay. Um, I, I, you're in a hotel room, right? So, uh, so sometimes uh, it's a bit it's a bit laggy, but it's all it's all good. So you shared with me that you think energy is money. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I think that the best possible yardstick, and I, I'm probably stealing this from you know Michael Saylor when he was first talking to uh, Bree Love on those first the first seven or eight podcasts, whatever it was. Um. Uh. But, and I, I, a part of me kind of knew this, but hearing it explained the way he did uh, kind of clarified it. Uh, the best way to measure anything is in energy. The question is just what is the measuring stick, right? Because energy is a fairly intangible uh, thing for, for us, right? You have, you know, kinetic energy, you have stored energy, you have, so it, right now I have the energy to stand up and walk across the room, but I'm not doing it. Right. So I have stored energy ready to do that when I need it. Um, it's a very interesting concept, but the more you dwell on it, you realize there's nothing we do that doesn't involve energy. Like, I mean, from the second we are created by birth, right, that is or even before birth inception, that is energy required. And it's thousands and thousands of years and millennia of energy that is kind of slowly come down to this one point in our lives where we're created, right? And then there's energy additional energy required, you know, by the mother, you know, to, you know to, to grow that child, birth that child, and then you have to feed the child to give it energy and all this. And there's so much more energy to grow. And then it, you're not just talking about flipping a light switch and, you know, doing compute power, but like, you know, uh, building a building, manual labor, right? It's all technically energy. The question is just how do you measure it? Right. So if we measured everything in kilocalories or joules, if you will, you could say, OK, um, you know, uh, this guy did uh, one barrel, one oil barrels worth of work today. Or this guy did, you know, this many CFM of, of gas or coal or 
uh, you know, this much electricity, this much kilowatt hour per work or what, right? But those are very difficult and problematic, right? So you need something in the middle. And up to this point, all we've had is um, just, you know, it's not tied to energy. It's not tied to anything. It may be at the one point it was pegged. We, you know, can use mm -hmm. gold and you peg to gold. But gold's problematic. It's tough to transact, and you got to chop it up. But it's hard to make change, and so that's why people led to fiat and coins and the dollar and all this stuff. But ultimately, because it's under a, a person, man's control, it's all manipulated, right? So, Bitcoin being work being built on proof of work, and being built on physics and mathematics, and basically immutable facts, right? They say Bitcoin is immutable. It, it's actually just, it's really just based on physics, uh, the laws of thermodynamics, right? It literally takes that proof of work, that energy, and transfers it into a, um, into a currency, right, without that middleman, so there's no chance of manipulation, right? If there's some consensus and we want to yeah. do, maybe make some changes to the code, we can do that, but... Uh, it is the closest thing to just measurement purely by energy available and the amount of work it takes to extract that energy and to turn it into a useful energy that we've ever had, right? So once you realize that, you start to look at everything a little bit differently, right? Um, it very... Okay, here we go. Sorry, I got a phone call. I'm back. Um, that gives me, yeah. it changes your viewpoint on um, when you see everything as energy. I don't even see it as Bitcoin. I see it as energy. But knowing that Bitcoin is tied to energy, that was when I switched and I thought, everything I do is money now, thanks to Bitcoin. Yes. So uh, having been terrible at you know, managing my money and finances from, you know, being a young kid, not understanding it. And then being in a system I was so frustrated with thinking I was losing, making terrible decisions. Really, I was just working within a broken system. Some people are better at playing that broken system than others, but it didn't make sense to me. Now, all of a sudden, when I think of energy, I'm like, okay, well, do I go to the gym today or not? Do I, would I rather spend my energy going to the gym or would I rather spend my energy here? And then I think, well, the gym is energy. This is energy. So this is sats. This is sats. This is money. This is money. You know, it was a, this, this amazing switch flipped. And I think that's probably when the, you know, that's probably the orange pill moment. And I was pulled out of the matrix and I'm like, I can't go back now. I can't go back. And so now it's yeah. easier for me to say, do I need to buy a new car or do I want to store some energy for, for the future? Or do I want to, do I need to spend money on this food or do I want to support? Well, you know, in that case, I want to spend the money on the food. Right. So it's like it's like you weigh things in energy yeah. in a new way that the benefits are so clear and so obvious to you that it just makes it so much easier to make smarter decisions for your future, for your financial future, and then also for your personal well-being. It transfers out of finances and just into every aspect of your life. Is this relationship good for me? What's it costing me? What's it costing me energy-wise? What's it costing me time-wise? Do I want to work with this person? Do I not? Do I trust this person? Do I not? Um, you know, do I do I want to live here? Do I want to live there? It all makes those decisions easier in a very unique way. And that's why I think it's so interesting yeah. that we are what we're doing is finally taking our decisions and tying them directly to energy. And Bitcoin is just the throughput. So Bitcoin is cool, but really that energy to our decision making connection. Is what is so makes it so profound. Dude, I love this answer. This is I, I, while you started talking, I was looking up a podcast that made this click for me, and it's not even a Bitcoin podcast. Mm -hmm. It's a I'm gonna say it, and I'll I'll try to think about uh, linking it in the show notes. But it's on the Aubrey Marcus podcast, and the title is. The shocking truth about our energy crisis with Nate Hagens. Mm -hmm. He's an energy expert. And they talk about all different kinds of things. But at one point he says, 
just also for the people listening, look around you, wherever you are listening, and everything you see has cost energy to create or still costs energy to maintain, right? So I see books made of paper and plants here, and I have a tea on the table, and, um, you know, I have this screen in front of me. Like, I have... Everything. I don't know... Um, you know, I had a carpenter fix the door, fix the door here. Like everything is energy. And like when I listened to that podcast, I was like, yeah, this is really it. Like this is really it, right? And that's also uh, like what you said about gold. Gold is actually really the, the money based on gold is really the closest we got to energy money, right? Because right. gold is also condensed energy within that piece of gold, right? Created by the earth so it does make sense to to create a, a paper currency that is backed by the rocks right right but as you mentioned it's difficult to transfer and we know we know all these things right yeah but yeah once you see that and then how i visualize uh bitcoin as being digital energy right it's physical energy transformed into a digital asset Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I also have this from Sailor, but at one point he described it as like, if you visualize like a 3D cube and that cube is one Bitcoin and that is made up of a hundred million little cubes, right? Mm -hmm. this, the Satoshis. And this Bitcoin is created through the usage of physical energy and that physical energy is taken and it's all put into these 100 million little blocks. And mm -hmm. it's captured there it's not physically captured there it's digitally represented right. right through the proof of work right <laughs> so you know that that one bitcoin with the 100 million little subunits was created by using real energy and then when you go to what you just said right if money is a way to exchange energy with each other we want to use money that is actually created by using energy because only then it has the right representation of the exchange that we yep. agree upon with each other, whatever it is about, mm -hmm. that doesn't really matter. Right. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I absolutely love this. And I think that is what eventually leads to what a lot of people say, you know, if we fix the money, we fix the world because if we can transact in, energy money mm -hmm. and i also love this old newspaper article i think it's henry ford right who talks about <laughs> energy money money backed by electricity right? yep i mean he saw it that, that this is the, this this is that uh bitcoin is that you know if we fix if the money is not broken anymore and we can agree upon whatever you know whatever you do for me is worth X, Y, Z, then we have a real free market because mm -hmm. then we are sovereign in our agreement Yes. Instead of having a third party being right. able to dilute the thing we use to exchange value with. Yes. Other, right? That, is, that the... is how we fix the world because then we yeah. fix all the perverse incentives. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, um, that is, yeah. so that realization isn't what told me Bitcoin was so great. That realization is what showed me money was so, was such a failure at that. Right. Like it was, or uh, sorry, money, yes. fiat currency. Right. It's like, you're storing your energy, and every year you lose 10% of that value if you're storing your energy, whereas Bitcoin is the opposite. So it, I'm, taking, I'm getting to take control of my energy, and I decide when and where it goes. Nobody else can decide that for me. And like you said, the free market, not somebody in Washington, you know, uh, at the Fed or, you know, at, the, um, at a central bank or whatever determines where my energy goes right now they're determining where my energy and when you think about it yes and you you talk about einstein's theory of relativity right i mean energy is time those two go together space time and energy are all intertwined so if they're taking my energy they're stealing my time and so i started looking at it and saying oh yes. well if i if i pay 20% in taxes every year they're taking, um, you know, uh, what is that? 36, 72 days every year they're taking from me. That's just for taxes. And then you take, yeah. um, then yeah. you take inflation 
And it's like, okay, well, it's even more. And you say, well, it's only 5% inflation. No, no, no. It was 5% inflation last year. If it's 5% inflation this year, you take your $100 down to 95, and then you take another nine and a half, you know, $4.25. It compounds, right? So, so it, over the, over time and over the years, it's like mm-hmm. they're stealing more and more of my years. By the time, I, I mean, if you do the math, like a five, a ten percent inflation, uh, a ten percent inflation debasement of your currency, right? In twenty five years, you may have saved X number of dollars, even if you invested at a certain percentage, right? It still debases faster than any percentage you can get right now. I don't care what they say. So yeah. somebody was like, somebody on Twitter posted. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. can do uh, maybe you can find my tweet. I can't remember, but they posted and said, "Hey, you want to have five million dollars or a million dollars by in twenty five years? Take five hundred eighty dollars a month, put it into these funds. You know, you know five hundred eighty a month." And then I and then I did the math, and I'm like, "Okay, but you're taking one hundred sixty four thousand dollars is what it is, right? And if you take ten percent inflation and it continues, even with the amount you're debt, you're five million dollars." Or your uh, or your million dollars or whatever the numbers were at that point in 25 years will only be worth forty six thousand dollars in purchasing power. So you're spending that time, that money, investing into one hundred fifty thousand dollars of today's time. So in 25 years, you can have fifty thousand dollars worth of purchasing power. Right? It it yes. the math doesn't <laughs> so it doesn't basically, work. You're you're putting it in a in a black hole. Yeah. 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 You're putting it in a black hole on the wrong end, basically, mm-hmm. right? And so it discounts your time. It discounts time and energy you already spent. Mm-hmm. And it discounts time and energy that you perhaps want to spend somewhere in the future, right? That's Correct. what Safe Dean talks about with short short time preference, long yeah. time preference. Yep. If you cannot save towards the future, how can you create time for yourself to pursue whatever you want to pursue basically yeah you stay stuck in the now yeah yeah and maybe to add to the visualization of the of the cube with the hundred million you know little parts in it if you if you see that visualize that and then on the other side think about what uh what 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 you just said david is that all the productivity of people is also energy yes right so yes. if you do something for me, you expend energy and I give you something that has captured energy back and you right. can save that thing until you spend it on something else that takes energy, right? Yes. Yes. So productivity is energy as well. So yes. what is the bigger thesis of Bitcoin? Why does Bitcoin grow in, in value, right? If there's 21 million of these cubes with physical energy captured in a digital way, again, divided by 100 million, on, that's on one side, and on the other side, we have all the productivity ever of all the people now and now and into the future. The that productivity is going to be captured yeah. in those twenty-one million well blocks of Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, because this is the best way for us to exchange that energy with mm-hmm. each other. I think that for me is like the bigger. The, the bigger thesis there as to does Bitcoin have value or where does it go, right? Slowly but surely, people will understand that this is the best way to save the energy that you get rewarded. And therefore, they will ask to be paid in this for the energy they expend. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you think about it, um, uh, I, Samson, uh, Samson Mode did... He said that, you know, if you take 8 billion people, 21 million divided by 8 billion, you have like 259,259 Satoshis per person. Um, I think that number is smaller. I think it's about 240 because I think that I, I personally feel that the million of Satoshis in Satoshi's wallet is truly burnt. I think it's gone. Uh, and then you have other, you know, uh, people that have lost Bitcoin, you know, that uh, – you know, that it'll just sit there until someone can figure out how to recover a wallet. But I think, um, I feel that it's really like 240,000 Satoshi, somewhere around there. And if you think about that, 240,000 Satoshis could encompass 
all of the productivity of us for the entire life of a single person. Right. So yes. think, so think about exactly. that for a second. Yes. If I start working at age 18 or 20, let's just say 20, a, a person starts working at 20 and they work till age uh, 60 or let's say 70, right? Those 50 years of whatever their, all of their life, all of the work they do, all the things they move, all the effort they put forth, uh, from getting up to going, those houses they live in, the food they eat, all of that could literally be encompassed in 240,000 Satoshis. That puts Bitcoin into a mm -hmm. very different perspective and number. Um, and then as, a, as people pass away, that, two, that 240,000 Satoshis or whatever it is goes into the next person that's born and becomes their energy, their, you know, uh, potential for their lifetime, right? So it's, and it's not even that, it's even more because you got to spend energy to raise that kid, right? To get it up to age 20. So it's like, looking at that, you think about that, you're like, man, if I say that, just take a fiat term right now and just assume that maybe over the course, the average person over the course of their life can produce maybe right now in today's spending, um, two million, three million dollars in overall total, you know, uh, work, revenue, spending, all of that, right? Three million dollars. Well, if a two hundred forty thousand satoshis is worth three million dollars, what does that make a Bitcoin target price? Now, that is a law. I think it's a little ways yeah. off, right? We'll we'll always have some, but I mean, we're talking about very difficult to calculate and comprehend numbers at that one point. point not, one billion or something. Yeah, something per Bitcoin, about, yeah. per Bitcoin, right? And that fiat mm -hmm. currency is not yep. going to change. So what's really interesting is how do we eventually monetize things in Satoshis? Well, you're seeing it real time in uh, places like El Salvador, right? With circular economies that are built directly on Bitcoin. They spent, let's say they spent, um, you know, uh, 100 million Satoshis last year on their living expenses, right? And they earned 100 million Satoshis, one Bitcoin, right? Well, as the value of Bitcoin goes up, like it did, now they get the same life, but they only have to spend 500,000, or uh, sorry, um, 50 million Satoshis now because it's doubled in value. So it's, you're seeing it happen. And the more Bitcoin is adopted, the faster that that drop will happen. And so uh, Preston Pish made a really good example. He's talking about houses, right? Like we we think backwards about a real estate. You and I, before the call, we were talking about real estate, right? And some of the opportunities there. Um, we're looking wrong at real estate. If you are doing well, your house or your business or your real estate should be worth less, not more. Right. The reason your house is worth more is because you're measuring it in a system that's broken. And so you're just hedging against the inflation. But realistically, if someone comes and buys that house from you, you still have to go live somewhere else. And if you just want to move down the road right next door. Right. You're you're not going to get ahead. Right. It's the same number. You're going to buy that same house. So it would maybe your house was worth 50 Bitcoin, you know. 10 years ago, well, now it's worth 10 Bitcoin, right? And then in two or three years, it'll be worth three Bitcoin. And then it'll be worth one Bitcoin. Then it'll be worth less than a Bitcoin. So that means the money you're using to measure is going up in value, giving you actual real opportunities to improve your life or do things differently, right? Um, that is a hard concept for us because we value everything on that fiat standard. So you're basically telling me you don't need yeah. to accumulate well, more no, Bitcoin. Wait. Yeah, we price it. Right, right. There you go. We price it. We don't value it. We price it. Right. So, so it's it's that is the hardest. I I, I tried to explain that to a normie not too long ago, a good friend of mine, and it's like it it just doesn't compute. Right. They're like, no, no, no. You know my. My 401k is going mm. up, my investments are going up, whatever. And I said, yeah, but they're not going up enough 
to beat out hyperinflation because it's only a matter of time before that catches up. It's every single do fiat dollar in history has eventually died and has been hyperinflated. Otherwise, we'd still be using denarii from Rome, right? So it's that is how entrenched we are in the system that psychologically we have to do, you know, no, we always think NGU, NGU, NGU. And really, on a Bitcoin standard, it's NGD, number go down, right? I, I bought a car at one Bitcoin, you know, five, 10 years ago. Now, with the same Bitcoin, I can buy five cars. That is actually the way that we need to think. And that is what's so hard psychologically for us to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I did uh, this exercise for uh, homes in my country. I took the me media, uh, the um, average uh, home selling price per month from 2014 until uh, now, mm -hmm. January 14th, January 2024, and then uh, denominated in uh, Bitcoin. And in 10 years, the prices in uh, euros went up 92%. In the same 10 years, Bitcoin went up, I think, 9,100%, uh, something like that. Yeah. And so when you look at the average, average home selling in 2014, it was, I think, 1,100 Bitcoin. And in January this year, it was 10 Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. No, less, actually. Eight, yeah, 10, 8, 8 to 10. Still, people don't understand it when they see that. <laughs> it's so interesting, you know, what, what that implies. Uh, yeah, it, exactly. it, yeah, it feels and, it's completely backwards. It makes no sense to uh, the way we've been conditioned to value things and value our time. It's completely backwards from how we should be valuing our time and our energy. Yeah. Last thing to add to that, and I'm I'm talking about this a lot actually last two, three weeks. Like I love the example of why is it funny that a bread was twenty-five cents fifty years ago and it's four or five dollars now. Like make it make sense, you know, if you believe that humans strive for optimization and efficiency through innovating in technology yes. everything you know this is what jeff booth says right everything should fall down to the you know prices should fall to the marginal cost of production so mm -hmm. we should basically have free bread now uh more nutritious than the bread of 50 years ago and not have five dollar breads mm -hmm. it's we are going back in time it's like the bread is a new invention right and it's coming on the market at a high price point mm -hmm. but that is not the case <laughs> no no it's uh so let me let me say this when i was in 20 probably 15 or 16 i read rich dad poor dad kiyosaki right and he is a very polarizing figure in bitcoin right he's he He's, uh, I don't know, I, I, it doesn't matter what your opinion of, of him is, but honestly, he's the first person that ever put it into my mind reading that book that if you have a, he said, a good society, and I think he, he didn't, I'm going to have to go look it up. I don't know if he said sound money, but he said a good society and that has good processes and good innovations. He said the price of everything you do or use in life should go down the price of it, the cost of it. And I was like, wow, that's, is yes. that even possible? And that was years before I really, you know, got into Bitcoin, right? Um, I might've actually read that, even read that book before I heard of Bitcoin. I can't remember when it came out, but it was just, um, it, it, that was eye-opening to me and something I thought about a lot. And I was like, how do you do that? Well, then I thought, okay, well, you know, you're, you're, Picking the apple illustration is good and easy, right? It's like the apple still takes the same amount of sun, the same amount of space, the same amount of time, the same amount of water to grow as it always has, right? As far back as you want to go. Yes. So why was an apple yes. a nickel 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? And now it's like 50 cents, right? So it's like, why is it? And they're, 
And I, I've had a conversation with an economist. This was really interesting. I was in D.C. at a bar, and we'd all had too much to drink. So the conversation got a little rowdy. But I was talking to someone that literally used to work in um, at, at a, the U.S. Central Bank and someone that used to work at the Federal Reserve. And I was like, where am I going to get this opportunity to ask him these questions, right? So I start asking him these questions. And every time I say something, <laughs> ask a question, I say, listen, I'm going to put parameters around it. I need you guys to stay in the ring here, in the guardrails, right? We can go down this path, but stay between here. And I'd say, if I have, you know, the land of David and I make, you know, uh, $2 and I give you each a dollar and there's one apple, right? What is that apple worth? To keep you to, for you to survive, and they're like, uh, "Well, I don't know." I said, "Well, if you don't have the apple, you're going to die." What's and you each have a dollar? What's it worth? And they're like, "Well, it's a, worth a dollar." I said, "Right." So who, I, whoever gets to me first gets the apple. They survive, right? And I have a dollar now, and now you have the apple, and then you grow an apple. Same thing, right? It's only worth one dollar. I said, "But what if I take and I give you each two dollars? Then what's the apple worth?" And they're like. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's worth $2. I said, right. What changed? The only thing that changed is the amount of money in the system. That is the only thing that changed, right? And I said, so I believe that the money in circulation is the only reason for inflation. And they're like, well, no. And I was like, well, why not? And they said, well, well, you know, we need debt for innovation. We need debt for new technology. We need, I said, well, why? I said, if you don't have a dollar and you're going to starve if you don't get that apple, you have motivation to go out and figure out another way to get an apple. Right. I said, but there's there's no way to issue debt. Take that out of the picture. Yeah. How does that apple increase in value? And they said, well, it doesn't. And I said, bingo. Right. But then they start saying, but it's not that simple. It's not compl It's complicated. You have supply and demand. You have other countries or whatever, all this stuff or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, you're just overcomplicating it. It's really that simple. But until you see it and really understand, take the time to absorb it and understand it. And they're going to be they're going to be a longer turn than I am. Right. Because they are literally living and working and breathing every day in that money system. So they're buying all of the lies, all of the works, all of the inefficiencies. And they're living in it. That's where their living is. They make their value in the inefficiencies of our fiat system. And so it was a great fun conversation, right? Yeah. And eventually we just had to say, agree to disagree. Let's enjoy our drinks. But they, it, it was really interesting to see someone. That was my only opportunity I've ever had to, to, to talk to someone on that level, that personally, um, in the fiat system. And it really just came down to they won't understand it because it's not complicated enough. They feel like if it's not complicated enough, it can't be right. And if I don't understand it or I disagree with it, I'm just not smart enough, right? I haven't gone to the right universities and I haven't studied economics the way they have. So that was a very interesting eye-opening uh, experience. And that tells me it's going to be when the dollar goes, and it will, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be violent. It's going to be like you know Zimbabwe or whatever, right? Uh, it's going to be like all those other places where the dollar has been hyperinflated and it'll hit us harder, harder, harder every year and it'll get harder and harder and harder. Yeah. Your internet was lagging a bit, so I hope people got that, but we'll see that in the, we'll see that in the edit. Great. Um, but yeah, to, to add to that, what I find interesting in the example of the Apple is, is great, right? Going back to what we talked about with energy. It still takes the same amount of energy to create the apple, like you said. So why does it need more units representing the same energy to pay mm -hmm. for it? This is really what people need to, to wrap their heads, heads around. And once you understand that, you also then understand that the value of your home, you know, didn't go up. The price went up because the value of what you price it in went down. It's the same it's as the apple. It's, it's not. It's not different because then people will say, well, homes are different than apples. No, no, no. It's, it's the same principle, right? And I also love what you said about these guys explaining like, oh, it's way more difficult than you think and blah, blah, blah. 
I've spent 10 years in the startup world. I've heard thousands of ideas. I've learned that if you have to substantiate your idea with more and more and more words and explanations, it's a bad idea, right? Like you can have a good idea in two to four sentences, but then if someone asks a question, right? If your idea creates more questions than, than answers, and then mm -hmm. you have to you know, give a speech as to why that is a bad question or no, 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 it's not the case, then it's just a bad idea. If you cannot convey it in two, three, four, five sentences, yes. then it's just a bad idea. So interesting experience there because they, that is their defense. Their defense is to talk where in Bitcoin, I love that, you know, it's the work, it's the walk. You can check. Yeah. You don't, anyone listening to us doesn't have to believe us. You can check that this money system actually works like this. It's audited by 18 and a half thousand computers every 10 minutes, right? Yeah. And the Federal Reserve in America has never been audited. But you mm -hmm. should believe two random faceless people you didn't elect based on their words, right? Like right. that should become more people's principle, right? Like yeah. I should not listen to this person. I sh they should give me the option to validate and verify if what they say is true. Yeah, it's um I, I read a book by an author called Bo Lozoff, L O Z O F F. And I think you're so, muted. Nope. Oh. Can you hear me now? Am I on there now? Yes. Okay. So I read a book by a, a gentleman called Bo Lozoff, L O Z O V F F. And I actually heard about him when I read Mr. Rogers' uh biography. Uh he was a big fan of Bo's work and uh and his writings and he has a book called deep and simple and he says that all thoughts and ideas uh that are simple that are true right are truly simple and easy to understand but deep and difficult to comprehend um as opposed to complicated and shallow right and so that was a very and he used that from yes. kind of a spiritual background to help uh, rehabilitate criminals and, and violent offenders and things like that. He was very, uh, it wasn't like religion specific, right? But it was a very interesting take. And he said, you know, it's like, uh, he he was a Christian. So, you know, as a Christian, it's like very easy. I believe someone made a sacrifice for me. And I feel like I want, based, based on that love, I want to live my life the way that, you know, kind of giving to others, right? So it's like, it's a very simple idea. But it's hard to put into practice and hard to really comprehend. It's deep, right? And so he would take those ideas. Bitcoin is like that. It's a very yes. simple idea, very simple. Um, something I am proud of is, uh, you know, people post. It's like, hey, a hundred thousand sats. Um, I'll, I'll give you a hundred thousand sats, to, you know, for the best answer to this question or whatever, right? And somebody posted on uh, X and. I responded, it said, describe Bitcoin in three sentences, right? And I was like, man, that's that's tough. It's like everybody was saying, oh, it's this, this, and this, and this. And people were writing whole paragraphs. And you're like, that is not a, uh, that's not three sentences, right? But uh, it was it was very simple. How do you describe it to someone who's never heard of it? And it's essentially, I just got, had three really basic points. It's one, it enables you to store your time and your energy in a way that it can't be stolen and taken from you. And it also, um, it's a way for you to be your own bank, store your time and energy in a way that no one else can steal it from you, um, giving you the opportunity to better plan for your future or something like that, right? It was super simple, but at the core of what Bitcoin is, that's what it does. I've got some connectivity issues. Hopefully I'm coming through here or at least at the end well it'll edit but that was um it's a very simple it's a very simple idea but it takes so long to absorb it and understand it because it's it's the ramifications are so deep yeah i actually had a i had a conversation with my friend today about why uh, we, we, I don't know, we talked and we ended up with like, you know, it is really true that the journey is more important than the destination. And then we had to laugh, right? Like, oh, that's such an old saying, like 
it's so dorky and simple, but it's always true, right? And but at one point, someone came up with this thought, and enough people actually agreed with it for it to become a thing that you know survived through time and is still something that we use today, right? And so mm. we talked about it, like why does it sound why why um why do we think it's dumb? It's it's kind of dorky, right? And then we agreed that it's kind of like this ego thing, right? Because you can, when you actually have experienced a certain journey, you know that that journey was way more fun and valuable than where you ended up, right? You you can feel that if you actually had that type of experience. But when someone says the journey is more important than the destination, you start to think, you know, rationally think. I think like, ah, oh, no, it could not be that simple. It is uh, blah, 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 like all these things. Like you, you think of stuff to add to that, right? Mm-hmm. And I think here it's the same thing with Bitcoin. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an ego test in that, in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. That if, um, and now, now, shit, now I lost my train of thought, but what I wanted to say is like, with Bitcoin, I feel like it is exactly as you said, it's a simple but very profound idea, right? We should use a money where energy is captured to exchange energy with each other, as we just talked about. But then there's so much history before before this, right? There's so much contextual information that that people can use to mislead perhaps your initial feeling of, hmm, that sounds like a good idea, right? And they throw you into this rational thinking distraction hole and try to bamboozle you basically <laughs> with all these, you know, models and uh, Keynesian and blah, blah, like all, the, all these things. And you know, eventually, and and every time I say stuff like this, I feel like some people listening to me will definitely find me like arrogant, right? Like, look at him talk or blah, blah. But it really, like, once you are here, it's just like, why doesn't everyone see this? Why are we letting ourselves being manipulated by these third third party faceless people that we don't know? And they are like messing up our time preference basically mm-hmm. right and our energy allocation because of that I, I don't i don't even know how to say it differently like this is where you end up right and like two weeks ago i had a conversation with a guy a very smart guy cto of a company and we talked about bitcoin and he was like yeah but i don't think it's going to be anything but he understood everything about the money being broken and the time preference being um uh, how do you say corrupted and and all these things, but then he said like yeah, but I still think people are people are egotistical and and they will um, uh, you know abuse each other etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I asked him like hey, do you have kids right? Because I well for me it's a big motivation to see if I can be part of something that can fix the money right. And he said no no no, but that's also a reason because I I don't have kids. And for me it was the first time like I know that some people think like this right but for me it was really the first time i had like a face-to-face conversation with someone i uh deemed intellectual and intelligent and open-minded and then he said that and that actually made me super sad man when i thought like and i also said that to him i said well so you basically gave up like you give up to the faceless third party people that just influence your life and instead of spreading your energy to anyone who wants to receive it. You just stay in this little corner of life and, you know, that is just it. And he said, yeah. And I found it so, yeah, just saddening. Just just seeing someone confine themselves because there is this influence over his life that he actually understands, but he still accepts it. You know, like what... I don't know, it was a little bit of a tangent, but what do you think of that? I I think that's... Um, let's see. Let me think about how to say this. Um, I hear a lot of people, and I talk about it too, I kind of joke about it, right, and saying toxic 
maximalism, right? It's like we're 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 just aggressive towards anybody, whether they're a normie or whether they're a, you know altcoin or whatever, right? It's like. And don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a maximalist, right? But I, I try not to be toxic, but some days you just get angry. But I realized talking to my friend, having this conversation, it was intense uh, because you're basically putting into question their very existence, right? You're putting into question the way that they value themselves. And so when you say you're not valuing yourself right, it's a very arrogant statement. Uh, it's very difficult to pose that in a way that doesn't sound uh, demeaning or arrogant. And so it's really easy to take that negatively, even if it's not meant that way. And I think when I say, if I say I'm toxic, I'm a toxic maximalist, I only get angry because I care about those people and I see what I see and I'm always doing the best. To And I, I feel like I finally have an answer to so many questions in life that were making me miserable, right? Just destroying me uh, all the way to my core, to my soul, right? And so when you talk to someone, especially someone close to you, family, or, you know, it, it's, I mean, I loved, you know, on Twitter, on X, hearing people talk about, you know, Happen to talk to their family at Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, and they're like, just this is me not trying to bring up Bitcoin, you know, it's like, I got to stay quiet. I can't talk about it or whatever, because it because it it does that to people. But we feel that way because we just so desperately want to help our loved ones or our friends or um, and sometimes even just the person who we see needs it. You know, it's like you see people that are not as good. You, I've been very blessed and very lucky to be able to make a living for the last couple, two, three years in this space. Before that, uh, coming into this space, I just thought I was coming in for a fiat job, right? And I got lucky. And before that, I mean, I was almost broke, right? Like I was losing the fiat game, right? So I was desperate. When I had, you know, no money in the bank, or even if I had a little bit of money in the bank, but I had debt, you know, on the credit card or something like that, and I was worried about how I was going to pay bills, I remember just laying there awake at night with all this anxiety and stress and just literally staring into the darkness, like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Right. And one of the things I mentioned to Sailor when I when I got to shake his hand and say hello was that, you know, I've done a 180. Right. I started putting my money in Bitcoin and valuing my time and effort and money in Bitcoin. And I still have a little bit of debt. Right. but it, I've been able to pay it off more aggressively. I've been able to save when I save my time and my energy, it lasts longer, right? The value of it that my time and energy has held because it's in Bitcoin, right? And so now I told him, I said, I'm evaluating things from an interest to Bitcoin perspective. And as long as I think I'm going to make more value putting my money in Bitcoin, I'm not going to pay that debt off early. I'll make the payments, right? But I'll put it in Bitcoin and, you know, just on a hunch, because I know if I leave it in dollars, it's not going to save anything. And paying off the debt uh, with a with a broken dollar doesn't get any easier. It just gets harder and harder and harder over time. So I did that. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, my own personal value, however you want to value my wealth or estate or whatever, right, went from being negative to being positive in a short, short period of time. And so now I'm like, this yeah. is the cheat code. This is the cheat code. I, I sleep like a baby. Like I sleep like I don't I don't worry about anything knowing my I'm storing my value in Bitcoin and knowing that I like you would think if you would ask me three years ago, how would you feel if you had zero dollars in the bank, no cushion at all, you know, and your bills are coming up or whatever? I was doing that. And I was stressed out and I was miserable and I was angry and I was unhealthy. And now it's like, I have zero dollars in my bank account. How do you feel? Oh, I'm great. I sleep great. I, I know my, you know, it's like, I know my time and my effort <laughs> is valued in a way that nobody else can, you know, what's it? Hard money you can't fuck with, right? It's like, I know that that my money is something that nobody else can mess with. I decide when to spend it. I decide what it's worth. And I decide how to store 
and how to use, right? That alone just took every all of those anxieties away. And so you want that for other people. You want that for your loved ones. I want it for my boys, right? Because I don't want them to go through this the, the same thing I went through for the last 20 years before I found it. Struggling with that that system that was broken, right? Yeah. I uh, I actually wanted to ask you what, how has Bitcoin had an impact on your life? But I think you just answered that. So that is there you go. Amazing. Yep. Um, let's let's move on to. Uh, I wanted to wrap up mm -hmm. to the last question that I I ask everyone, and that and that is what is a core belief that you will never let go. What is a core belief that I will never let go? Man. Um, I think this is, this is kind of, this goes back to your comment about the intellectual individual you were having a conversation with that, you know, just kind of made you sad, right? Uh, nothing we do in this life, in my opinion, is incredibly valuable unless it helps others, right? And I feel that the best way you can help others and help yourself, right, is to have kids. Uh, or if it if it's not kids, you need to find someone else in your life, right, that you live for. So I guess the core belief is life is better when you live for others than when you live for yourself, right? So uh, I think now, especially in this community, so many people that didn't have connections, didn't have family, didn't have, you know, a uh, support net, right, from a friend perspective, person perspective, um, they found their tribe. You know what I mean? And so when you find that tribe and you're great, truly grateful for what you have and what you've been given, you don't want it all for yourself. You want to give it away. You want to help other people. And so uh, even when it was painful in this industry and, you know, I was working for free trying to learn things and do things, my goal was just to always try to, whoever's in front of you, whoever you're talking to, do whatever you can to make your life better, right? And and one of the best compliments I've ever received was from someone we're walking around and um, walking around like uh, actually a Bitcoin conference, right? And they said, wow, it's like, it's like you're a, uh, you you find somebody or something that you think might be interesting to me, right? And you willingly bring me into the conversation and then just step back, right? It's not about us. It's about what we're doing for other people in the future and stuff. Um, and I, that that makes me feel better, right? Than when I get accolades or I get things you know, people tell me thank you or, or whatever, right? It's like, uh, we're all just building on the great stuff that other people have done. Um, and we're all just building for the future, right? Eventually, we're all going to be gone, right? So the question is, you want a legacy, you want to be known, or even if you don't want to be known, you just want to do good things, right? You just want to make this world better. You have to look for opportunities to do something better for other people, not yourself. And so my core belief that I'll never, ever let go of is um, living living for others is always better, always better than living for yourself. And so that is a, I mean, it works everywhere. It works everywhere. I guess it's kind of the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or even do unto others better than you, you know, you would like yourself. So that's probably my. That's probably my core belief. Love it, man. Thanks so much for sharing that. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me and, too, Brian. Uh, I will link to your Twitter or X account so people can follow you. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, man, let's stay in touch. And thanks again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. 
And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.